Um, the first thing I'm going to say is there is nothing wrong with white men. <laughs> right? Right? What I have a problem with is when teams are all the same and when there is no diversity of thought. That right there is the problem. And if you think about it, when the seatbelt was invented, women and children died. And they died because it was invented by men of a certain weight and height. And that right there is why diversity in design is super important. So we're here to talk today about minding the gap. And one thing I just want to talk about is what are the, what's the context in which we're operating in? And the context is this, is that we are simply creating more jobs than we can fill. This country has close to full employment. On top of that, the borders are arguably closing to technology talent from overseas. Whether you agree with it or not, it's harder and will become even harder for people to come into the country. On top of that, our domestic talent pipeline is way too small. So we sort of have a triple hit issue. And the pace of tech means that we have to create jobs um, and, and skill up people for jobs that don't yet exist. So it's all, it's super interesting, but super difficult. And this is where, when uh, John was talking earlier about how do we leverage the machine nature of technology together with building relationships and make sure that we can recruit at pace is becoming increasingly important. Although, we also then need to think about retention. So how do we not only just recruit them, but keep them? Because frankly, the next generation, I'm 56, so when I say the next generation, I'm two generations probably after me. Um, but you know, they care about balancing profit with purpose. So the companies that young people want to work for are ones that we really care about and serve great coffee. And care less about the pension, maybe, I don't know, but um, because life's too short. And also, um, John mentioned that people don't stay in jobs that long anymore. So, you know, the carousel goes and goes around much, much faster. So, um, I did have a big speech here, but actually I think I'm going to go off piste here. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about in terms of diversity is who watched the wedding of Meghan and Harry in the summer, right? You're American, you'll be forgiven. <laughs> um, what else was anyone doing? Anyway, so when the preacher was in the pulpit, do you remember the preacher? Yep. Right, he went off topic over protocol, so he extended his time by twice the amount of time he was allocated. He was telling the royal family how to behave now that they had a black woman in the family. And, you know, he was totally irreverent for a reverend. And if you think about what happened, if you notice the BBC cameras, what were they doing? The royal family were all in the wooden pulpits, very large hats, and underneath these hats, they were tittering, giggling, looking at each other sideways, sitting on their hands thinking, oh my God, this preacher's just completely lost all sense of protocol. Now, the lesson I took away from that, once we got into the song, thank God, that the choir, you know, stand by me and all that, that everyone was crying and rejoicing. Um, but what I took away from that was that actually, when you are embracing diversity, it is a little bit uncomfortable. And the royal family demonstrated that in spades. And that's okay. And if you aren't uncomfortable when you're embracing diversity, then it's probably not very diverse. And it's probably not very inclusive. So that level of tolerance is a really interesting part of where we need to become as real thought leaders and change agents. And I was very struck by the first panel when um, I think John asked the panel, whose job is it to make this change? this diversity of thought change, this how do we create that change? And the answer was this, is that the cavalry probably isn't coming. So if you're waiting for someone else to fix this, you're going to be waiting a long time. 
And I'm going to use this hashtag, by, hashtag bystander or participant here. And it's a bit of a challenge to everybody to say, you know, whose job is this? And it's all about jobs. And the two millimetre differences that everybody makes in the diversity and the inclusion stakes, they really matter and they really move the needle. So everybody that you embrace and every change you make in policy, every change you make in practice of diverse and inclusive hiring, recruitment and retention, it, it changes the needle um, in the direction of travel that we're going in. So with that, I would like to introduce my panel, I'll get them to introduce themselves actually, and we're up for an exciting and thought-provoking um, session, I hope. So, Lena, would you like to introduce who you are, what you do, and why you care about diversity and inclusion? Mm. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Paulina uh, Sibulska tenner uh, you can call me Pau. I started a company called Grant Tree eight years ago now. These days there are nearly 40 of us, we've got something like £4 million turnover, so a kind of decent approaching medium-sized uh, company, which I started in my second bedroom while in debt, so uh, uh, a hell of a ride. What we do is not fascinating by in any <laughs> shape or form. No, I'm serious. We get, we essentially enable super interesting clients, over 600 of them, to get funding for their research and development from the government. So what our clients do is way more interesting than what we do. But the way we do it, and why we do it, is I feel more interesting. And the way we run the company is, um, we run with full financial transparency, um, with holacracy as a governance system, if any of you have heard about it, it's an alternative to a hierarchy giving power back to the people, uh, to a degree where people are able to set their own salaries and have a say, major say in what direction the company is taking. So we've taken some huge risks there, and I, um, I really believe that, it was interesting what you said about the new generation, I really believe that we are entering, we are living the future of work. And because of the kind of people I uh, revolve around, I uh, will talk about more about that. Yes, I'll shut up for now. Great. <laughs> you would. Um, I'm your co founder and CEO of White Hat. And for those of you who don't know us, we are a tech startup building an outstanding alternative to university through apprenticeships. So we believe that it's our mission to create a diverse group of future leaders. And the way in which we do that is through building these great apprenticeship programs. And we basically focus on three areas to make this happen. The first is to open up hiring, so give employers a framework to measure potential that isn't just based on work experience and academics, because that bit is pretty crucial. The second is to get some of the best content and practitioners from around the world and bring it into apprenticeships, because without having those stretching, developing learning programs, you're not really giving people a fantastic experience. And then the third and final part is in many ways the most important, it's to plug apprentices into an on and offline community of other apprentices. So they can build social capital, they can network with each other and learn from each other. And I think at a top level, the societal challenge we're trying to address is how do we make sure that the very best jobs, particularly in tech, of the next decade, don't just go to the same people that the very best jobs of the last decade went to. Because if we can't solve for that, we're going to see far worse outcomes than Brexit and Trump and some of the things that have happened across the world over the last few years. Thank you. Uh, I'm Jordan McRae, the CEO and founder of Mobilis Labs. Um, what we do is fascinating. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, we, we've developed a hardware software platform for voice communication um, for extreme environments. So the hardware, uh, we use something called bone conduction, two-way bone conduction. It essentially allows you to receive and transmit voice uh, without anything in your ears or anything in your hands, just through vibration on your head. So we have a small module that goes into the back of your head, uh, vibrates, you don't feel the vibration, but you hear a voice inside your head. Um, is effectively the result. Um, <laughs> um, it's apparently very similar to uh, many episodes of Black Mirror, which I also didn't see, apparently. Uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know, I must be building a company or something. In a cave. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and the software, one of the things we were just talking about a minute ago, the, the software also has some interesting aspects to it, one of which being 
um, algorithms to automatically switch the different network through different networks. So one of the insights is that no one really cares what network you're on uh, now when you're communicating, whether it be Wi-Fi or 4G, um, using Bluetooth for some reason if you're streaming between devices. No one really cares. It used to be that you did because it costs more. There was some advantage, disadvantage. Now it's fairly ubiquitous. So. We have a system that allows you to sort of start in a room on Wi-Fi, move out of that room onto the street, and switch to 4G, and you, you wouldn't know the difference um, is, is the objective. Um, and so we're using this software and hardware for teams in extreme environments where there's a lot of noise, where there's a real health and safety or sort of high value uh, risk associated with not being able to communicate with, an, with a team. So first responders, emergency response, uh, warehouses, factories, and, and things of that sort. <laughs> I'm just thinking there's an application for people who aren't listening and then the voice just appears in yeah. their head. <laughs> you, need to, you need to hear this. June. Lovely June. Hi, I'm June Angelides and I'm the founder of Mums in Tech. And I am that person that makes everyone uncomfortable usually. I usually turn up with a baby. There's none, none in the room today. Um, but yeah, I, I founded a company where um, mums come with their babies into amazing tech companies like Marks and Spencer and the Ministry of Justice and and you know come and learn about technology and I think it's really about breaking down the barriers and making it accessible for all um, and really just opening up that world of tech to people who may not ordinarily feel that they have a place in it and that's what I'm really passionate about and flexible working. Yeah, thank you. So my first question is how do we how do we widen participation? I mean you know, we, we always employ the same old, same old. I mean, some recruiters, dare I say, I don't want to get killed for this, you know, there are lazy recruiters out there who just go to their normal networks and don't, don't look any further than that. How can we change that particular aspect of finding people and sourcing? So I think one of the ways, and this is broadly how we look at apprenticeships, is you've got to build on-ramps for people to access opportunities. So I was in the US recently and we met a really interesting guy who was the founder of a kind of pre-social network called Black Planet. And basically they had at one point millions of African Americans signed up to their platform communicating with each other. And they would frequently get approached by employers who would say, right, we need to find uh, a black systems engineer in Cincinnati. And we can see you've got lots of members here, so please can you find us one? And invariably, they'd turn around and say, actually, we can't, because none of our members can do that. No one is being trained to do that. And the challenge is, if we don't, at the very start, create these pipelines of talent where people can be trained and skilled from a broad range of backgrounds in doing things like software engineering, data science, UX, UI design, we're not going to have successful outputs from that. So we've got to widen participation by actually having employees invest early and this is where the introduction of the apprenticeship levy by the government is such a positive move because it is forcing every company to be thoughtful about how they can use apprenticeships as part of their strategy. And we see now companies like Google, Facebook, Apple, BP dropping their degree entry requirements. So the world is changing. We've just got to make sure more people and more employers are aware of this. But how, how, do, we, sorry, how do we make sure that you know, one of the things I think, when I hear the word degree or apprenticeship or learning, it feels like a long time. And I don't know about you, but employers want this, these people now. I mean, the pace is what makes this a tricky problem to solve. Jordan. Yeah, I think, I think one of them from the very beginning is you have to be really clear on why you want to bridge that gap, why you want more diversity as opposed to, I mean, a lot, I think what motivates a lot of um, high-tech startups one of the first things is they see their team picture and it's all white guys, let's say, um, and they realize that that's bad, um, just bad, socially bad for the optics, and so they want to change that. I don't think that's a really good reason. There has to be something more substantial as to why you want more diversity, why you want more inclusion. So I think you, from the beginning, have to have a reason. In our case, it's really about a balance between um, short-term and long-term objectives. Uh, short-term, we could actually get by with a whole team of white men from Imperial College. We could actually just kill it on a short-term sort of roadmap. Um, Long-term, I'm not so convinced. And then the problem is, is that if we don't have that inclusion and we don't have 
uh, more women in our company, which is one of our biggest challenges right now, uh, more people from different uh, backgrounds, we won't get them later. I basically have to fire everybody and then start again. Um, so it has to begin in the beginning um, so that we can get to that long-term objective. And then the, the second thing I would say is that um, we should sort of brace, uh, embrace stereotypes. Like stereotypes usually come with a negative connotation. Uh, if you're like a, a math nerd like myself, you can use a different and you want to play around with language. Statistical conclusions, right? Um, so there's things that we feel uncomfortable about in terms of stereotypes when people say, and I'm going to give an, a typical American disclaimer, I don't, these are not my beliefs, these are, these are examples, let's say. I don't condone any of these stereotypes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, my best friend thinks it. So you will hear things like um, stereotypes around men. We're more aggressive. We take more chance. Uh, women are less, uh, are more risk adverse. Let's say um, Americans or British are more passive aggressive. Uh, these things make us uh, uncomfortable to some extent. But then there are stereotypes like um, I heard one the other day was super interesting, which is if you create a job description and you have five bullet points of what's required for that job description. If a woman sees that job description and she doesn't have all five of them, she won't apply. If a man sees that and he's got two, he's like, I'm a shoo in and he'll apply. And this can, and whether this is right or wrong, I don't know, but this could explain why for our software development um, profiles, I know that there's plenty of women out there that are capable of fulfilling that job. I don't get any applications, right? So there must, there's probably things that I'm doing as a founder, as a recruiter, um, that I could adjust if I specifically want more inclusion, more applications from a more diverse background. And you could, for example, say, I only need two out of five of this list. Yes, for exactly. example. Yeah, you pick, I mean, it's sure that there's probably two that are your real priority ones. Um, and then the other ones, and, and as a man, I probably wrote it thinking, I only need these two, but I'm going to put these four here because they're going to apply anyways. Um, and so that type of insight, which, which does come from you know, that, that stat that I gave you, probably most of you in the room are like, yeah, that probably makes sense. That's probably true. But it, it's just as much as a stereotype as some of these other things you might hear. So there's, there's an interesting thing, I think, about like, hearing those things and trying to figure out what of them are just sort of a broad generalizations and what of them you can actually action on um, and test and see if that helps you get to your objective. And thank you for the energy behind that. Um, what I will say is, is that stereotyping starts really young, doesn't it? Um, we paint our nurseries certain colors, don't we? And so it starts really young. And, and actually, also in tech, I've noticed that when we, if we were starting a football team for the, for the nation, we would scout for talent at age, what? Eight? In tech, we expect them to rock up fully formed at age, you know, 18 plus. So that's kind of an odd thing to do as well. But stereotyping, Jim, we do that through, you know, this is for girls, this is for boys, this is a girl job, this is a boy job, this is a girl toy, this is a boy toy. So how do we, how do we stop? Where do we start and stop with that? What's allowed? Are you, are you allowed to have a pink jumper? Pink? Is that frowned upon? Well, I mean. I've got, I've got a son, I've got two daughters. I think for me as a parent, it's my responsibility to educate them and make them aware that those opportunities exist for both of them. The other day my son said he wanted to work at Facebook and he wanted to build robots. And I said, yeah, Ivy can do that too. So it's just making him aware. And I think that conversation sort of has to seep through the education system really early on. The role models need to go in. I love like the founders for schools going in and having those conversations, letting them see, yeah, women are scientists and a woman can be head of, you know, the Royal Academy of Engineering. And I think those conversations need to be continued at home, you know, just really showcasing that it happens. I think that's right. And there is this idea that you are a role model whether you choose to be or not. And this is evidenced by if you talk to your children or your little people in your life in some way and you know, you don't think it's actually landing any of the messages that you're saying. You say one swear word, and I promise you, they will pick it up in a heartbeat. So you are a role model, whether you choose to be or not. And that's quite interesting in both families and leadership, and those subliminal messages that we give to our kids. Just one thought on the stereotyping, though, is that I was told the other day that, you know when we name hurricanes, or tornadoes and things, you know, Hurricane Harry, and you know, or this is Storm Juliet. P 
Apparently, when it's named after a woman, people take less action to avoid the storm or the hurricane than if it's named after a man. Go figure. <laughs> right? And more people die when they're named after women. Oh, no. Yeah. Fact. <laughs> Fact. Shocking, right? I'm just my point on stereotypes. Yeah. Anyway, how? Thoughts on? Now, I'm super interested. Self-managing teams. I would love to, to sort of name my own salary level. Right, who, who wouldn't Why want to don't do you? Well, well, I do, sort of, actually. <laughs> <laughs> hey, please, this is the example. <laughs> my point is, though, in a team, I don't know if I want feisty women on my panels, but anyway, we've got one. Um, Self-managing teams, though, naming your own salary. I mean, the idea of that sounds like entirely unmanageable. How do you, how, how does that work? It sounds un unmanageable until you have a kind of culture um, <coughs> on the style where you actually believe in people and where you actually so it's the people you it's the type of person you choose absolutely that and that's when we, we we're going to get to right. how we recruit for right. that but it, it it is about really giving people power and not just giving people power to make a decision on something but to be able to defend that decision yeah. to take that decision responsibly because if everybody knows what that salary is there's going to be conversations Normally they're water cooler conversations, but here they're going to be out, out there conversations. So, so it's just believing that people, we are adults, we can handle that. And we, if we cannot be trusted with figuring out how much we are worth in the workplace, how the hell can we be trusted with a company budget, with really uh, taking the lead in some really innovative project? So that's where I, where I come from personally. And, and, and just on the diversity side of that. Yeah. So, there are, you know, lots of women who suffer from self-worth, and uh, you know, and I certainly counted myself in that uh, when I was younger. And I would say that women might have a tendency to say, "I'm not worth that much." I mean, we've been there, right? So, how do you, how do you talk about? That? Yeah, very good question. So, I think it's not necessarily just a women thing. It's the what incentivizes you and some people are more incentivized by pay and more willing to really step up for themselves some people are less and statistically probably more of those people will be women so we have biannual salary reviews where we're still kind of changing our systems and constantly figuring out what's best but to make up for the fact that some people are going to be more eager reviewing their salary on an ongoing basis than others we have regular salary reviews to encourage people to go out there and spend time talking to recruiters to actually find out, realistically speaking, what kind of job in that kind of sector they would be able to find and to really make a decision, do I want to stay in this company? Like, is this something that's aligned with my growth as a professional as well? So we encourage people to really uh, review their salary um, periodically based on the complexity of what they do and based on the uncertainty that they're facing in their everyday And do you think it can scale? I mean, if I was, you know, a 50,000 person company, can that scale? I totally believe so because of the, uh, of, of the books I've read and the leaders I've spoken to when, it's, when, you, t when you take companies. We were actually inspired by uh, many, many years ago when we decided to introduce Open Salary by Ricardo Semler, the uh, founder of Semco. Um, when he took over his company from his father in the 80s of the last century, he was 21 years old, and he <laughs> fired 80% of senior management on day one because he knew he was going to implement changes that would be frowned, frowned upon. The company was at this stage, I think, tens of thousands of employees, and because it was divided into smaller self-managing units, those units could self-manage yeah, okay. and Makes sense. representatives Makes come sense. together to kind yeah. of learn about company strategy, etc. So I believe there is a way to make it scalable, absolutely. I'm going to ask you and Jordan this question. Would you implement Pau's version of self-managing teams? Yeah, I think it's, it's a difficult thing to do for organisations if it's not immediately embedded in their DNA right at the start. It's a, we're not looking at implementing something like that for now. And I think a lot of companies would fall into that category. I'm not saying it can't work. It's definitely not the only way that's right. right. I just, I, I honestly think so. It's but I think for some it is important, particularly when you're looking at recruitment and attracting people, 
what is it that makes your proposition different? And is it a way of managing people, a way of paying people like this? Is it, for example, we're obsessed at White Hat with values-based recruiting. We talk all the time, not about looking for culture fit, which isn't all that interesting to us, but looking for values fit. And how can people demonstrate they're using those values on a regular basis? Because the fact is, and you'll find nearly every tech company in the world will say, okay, we're making the world a better place with our CRM system or whatever it might be. <laughs> and we're a little skeptical of that oftentimes. We're talking about trying to give young people opportunities in a very meaningful way. This attracts a certain type of person to it who finds appealing the idea of working at what is still a commercial organization, but is actually one that is very consciously linked its revenues to trying to make the world a better place. And so I think it's about each company finding their kind of sweet spot in terms of how they appeal to people and how they construct that vision. So really, this is what we've spent our time focusing on. Yeah, I think, I mean, I have to understand a little bit more about what it means by self management. It sounds like it's more than just sort of setting your own salary, which when, when that was first said, I thought, well, who doesn't? Set, I might be a little bit naive, but who doesn't set their own salary? I mean, of course, there's a negotiation, but I, my expectation is, you know, when we recruit and you come in, that's one of the first questions is I ask you, what's your expected salary to see uh, if it's a fit? And it's true that different people from different cultural backgrounds have very different ways of responding to that question. So then it's about how do I adjust for those uh, differences, right? Um, and, and you have to have a value system. You have to have sort of a, a long-term objective, again, of if fairness and sort of transparency and um, I guess uh, trust is our important values within your company, um, you may save a couple thousand dollars here on a salary that's going to come and bite you a couple years down the road um, with respect to those values. So um, I, do, I do, as sort of like a global term, I do actually believe that that's quite important for us. So we have um, one of our, um, one of the aspects of our culture is what I describe as sort of aggressive ownership, so that each individual owns their individual responsibilities and they're accountable to each other um, in terms of those uh, deliverables and those responsibilities. So that's sort of self-managing, is yeah. it? I mean, I, I, I'm not familiar, as familiar with the term, but it sounds like it's exactly without using the same term, that's what, um, that's what we're about. Um, and we have to be that way because we're a small team and we have a, a very complex system that we have to build. So. You. So in terms of um, how do we give advice to people who are in the recruitment business in terms of ensuring that we create diverse teams, widen participation, what, what is your piece of advice for the audience? Well, I think if, if you're looking at you know, creating that welcoming environment, really think, get to know those communities, spend time with the people you're hoping to attract. And also really think about your customers. I guess ultimately you want your customers to walk in and feel comfortable and feel that they're representative in, in your company in some way. Because at the end of the day, you're building products for them. Um, so really, um, I believe in the open door policy. I think that really worked well you know, for the Mumson Tech program going into companies like New, you know, that feel, you know, makes amazing business cards. They open up their doors to women and kids to come and learn about First of all, how their businesses work, and about the technologies that they use, and the, the different departments that people could fit into. So open, open up your doors. Let people come in, have have a morning session, have an afternoon session. Think about just um, making it as accessible as possible, um, and letting people know what you're really about, what the the different teams, how they operate. Um, and I think that's a good starting point in really showing. And, you know your values, I, and I agree with you. The and it's, I think it is about values. I think we use the word word of culture too often, and that can be off-putting. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And also, really think about who is sitting on your hiring teams, who is making that decision. I think that's something we overlook so much. What do the recruiters look like? Are they representative? Because they 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 may not be able to empathize with you know if they've not had kids. I don't know. Just say. Um, maybe they can't empathize with someone having to wake up early to come to the interview. Just really thinking about putting yourself in that person's shoes and just being as open as possible to that. And in the context of, you know, we've got to recruit at pace now because we've got full employment, we're creating so many jobs, we don't really know what the skills are that need. What, what advice would you give to the recruiters out there? 
in terms of recruiting at pace and having yeah. to, okay, so first of all, as a founder, yeah, you can probably, I understand that you probably, if, particularly if you're a venture founder company, you might be looking for 10 developers for yesterday. But think about the cost of wrong hires. I've estimated that it's close to a million pounds in my company before we really evolved our recruitment systems and kind of there's a lot I could talk about there. But the long-term cost of, of bringing someone in, um, embedding them into the company systems, um, and working with them, and then uh, things not working out is, is huge. So I would I would really urge funder, uh, founders to take their time, um, even if that means a kind of stress and frustration to begin with, because you, you've got to get things done, and to really take time and get get to know candidates over multiple stages of interview. So we've got at least four, and it's really important for us. We actually put a lot of money into recruitment. In I interview um, a lot, I really enjoy it, particularly when it comes to kind of self-management or open culture interviews that, that we do that are specifically <coughs> focused on what kind of person you are and what level of complexity in your environment can you handle. And yes, we do have a scientifically developed framework that we use to, to test that, as opposed to can you do the job and have you done an equivalent job before. So I'd say take your time. And I'd say to recruiters, um, really uh, widen your pool. So right now I'm interviewing a lady for a sales position um, from an African-American background who's never had a job in tech. And she's fantastic. I don't see any reason whatsoever why with a bit of training, and she seems to be able to pick up things very quickly, she wouldn't be able to sell our product and our service. So really think out of the box. And that a colleague of mine is interviewing somebody with um, I can't remember whether it's dyslexia, but it's some kind of disorder where um, it, it's, it's, it's to do with how you understand things that, that you read. And we're having a big team-wide discussion, okay, if we want to have a kind of team that represents society um, and our clients, like how, do we, how, how can we create an environment that will serve this person just as all the others of us who don't have that particular disability? So, I honestly believe that for long-term success, what you said, I think it's paramount. If you're after just a short-term buck, that's fine, but I don't think any of us really are. And I think that's, that's really interesting, that as, as the pace of technology increases, that our ability to leave a lot of people behind is quite high. So that inclusion piece of people of all capabilities um, is super important as we move forward. And actually, in cyber, we prefer people who are on the autism and the Asperger's spectrum because they can spot patterns much yes. more easily yeah. than us mere mortals. And we like to think of them as you know, not ordinary people, but extraordinary people with those kinds of abilities. So they are super useful when you come across <laughs> people like that, especially for cyber jobs. Jordan, it's a, advice. Yeah, it's a tough one for you. Like, at, on one hand, I agree with everything that um, that you just said, and then I realize that um, we're doing everything in the opposite direction. And, and maybe it's a it's a, it's it's a poor excuse, but I think a lot of times as a tech founder, early stage, uh, you run into a lot of constraints. You have a limited amount of uh, runway, um, and uh, this is not all to just blame it on the VCs in the world, but um, you have a limited amount of runway, you have a limited amount of cash, and you have some very ambitious objectives that you have to achieve before the next fundraising round, um, and you need an excellent team in that short amount of time to deliver on that. And so we're exactly at that point where we've raised money, we need to basically double the team, we need to do it fast we, so that we can execute on this, those deliverables and sort of repeat the whole process again. So part of the, all of those constraints lead us to almost the opposite conclusion, which is we don't have the time. Um, and uh, my advice almost will go in the other direction, which is, um, and perhaps biased by my experience, which is really think about the few key things that are important. Um, and usually they can't be tested in an interview process. You only figure them out once the person is on the job. And so then it's a question of um, how do you set up an appropriate amount of probation period um, with really, really, really clear objectives communicated from both sides and, and from the very beginning have a really transparent conversation that says, hey, um, we have really high hopes about you coming in. We're super excited, um, but it's still to be seen. Um, and that's kind of an uncomfortable question because usually you want to feel like you get the job, you got the job. Um, but that's not exactly the case, especially for us with hardware. Like, you either do know how to solder a board together or you don't. And if you don't, 
as nice as you are, it's going to be really tough to continue to have you on board if, uh, if we have a limited runway, right? Uh, maybe in a couple of years when we get to that point and I can sort of switch that logic and say, okay, let's teach this person how to solder a board and invest in it. But right now, I, I feel like I almost don't have that luxury. So I think it is about setting clear objectives in the beginning. And the same thing goes for the person. Maybe they won't like working with our team um, and it's not a good fit for them. And so having that ability to have a mature conversation to say, we're gonna see how it works, we're gonna do it fast, we're gonna get in. If it doesn't work out, um, it's okay, we'll figure out a mature and professional way to, to, to have you exit the company. Um, and it'll be clear all along the way. And I think, I think that's a process that not only makes it more sustainable, but maybe makes it faster as well in terms of bridging the gap. I think I'm both excited and scared. <laughs> <laughs> you and yeah, I think on that point in particular, actually, one thing we should be mindful of is avoiding the kind of the false choice trap that we're choosing between diversity or excellence. Because a lot of the time, the problem is there are fantastic people out there, just that for whatever reason, your company would never meet or would never end up in your recruitment funnel because, for example, they don't have a university degree. And so we've got to try and make sure we are messaging across a broad set of audiences and meeting all of those people in the first place and getting them into the recruitment funnel. And I think. The, the best piece of advice I could give is probably to avoid lazy assumptions and challenge them where possible. So a great example is, we hear this from a lot of employers, um, we need someone who can hit the ground running, so we want to hire a graduate now because they're going to be more experienced and more mature than a school leaver apprentice. And to that I say, just meet some of our apprentices. We placed a 19 year old last week who had not only been caring for her mum at home, but had been managing a pub where she was responsible for accounts payable, receivable, managing the rota, and try and tell me that she's less mature or well-equipped to do your operations job than a graduate who's just come out of Bristol University and has, in some cases, spent three years maybe not learning all that much that is useful to them. Um, and this is the case where, you know, we placed a kid at age 18 from a, a Crystal Palace's Youth Academy. Broke his leg age 16, had to work his way back to fitness, and was getting up at 5 a.m. every morning to train. A typical nine to five job seemed easy in comparison. And so try and look at competencies, values, desires, some of the things that are below the surface, and it's incumbent on us, and one of the things we're trying to do with our platform is to, is to raise those things to and bring them to recruiters' attention. So for example, if you went to a school where you were in the top 10% worst performing schools in the country, and got three Bs at A-level, that's actually far more instructive than if you went to Eton and got three A's. You've had a very different experience and you've had to work harder to get there. So we need to avoid those lazy assumptions. I think that's really, really interesting. And um, we are lazy with those assumptions, aren't we? Because we don't listen to people's life stories. And those life stories make us very streetwise and very capable. So we're going to go to questions. But just before we do go to questions, I just want to point you to a really interesting TED talk by a lady called Margaret Heffernan. I don't know if you know her. She's my mentor. And she has this TED talk on super chickens. Have you seen it? So super chickens is really interesting because she has these two sets of chickens. One set, normal set of diverse average chickens. It's really easy to see productivity of these chickens because they lay one egg a day, right? Clear. So you know when they're being productive. And this is other set of chickens. And these are super chickens. And these are chickens that can lay up to five or even six chickens a day. And they leave them for six generations to see how they get on. And what happens is, because the super chickens are all bred to be very similar, what happened after six generations was that the diverse chickens all roaming around one egg a day, they were still roaming around, 100 eggs a day, perfect. Super chickens, all but three were dead. Why? Because to survive, they had to kill each other and fight for survival, fight for the, you know, the supreme um, top egg-laying chicken. My point about that is that diversity really matters if you want outstanding business outcomes. If you want super chickens, hire everybody who's the same. They'll just peck each other to death. Anyway, right, shall we go to, shall we go to, to um, questions for our amazing panel? Microphone's coming your way, I hope. We have got time for questions, right? Yes, no? Yes. Will you tell me when we're finishing our session? Okay, good. Great. So, uh, we had a, a question here.
First off, that was awesome. Thank you for sharing. Um, I have you watched Black Mirror? Because you're American. I have, yeah. For sure. <laughs> it's really scary. I know. Uh, I want to talk about the future of work, which everyone seems to have a different opinion on. Uh, we know jobs are being automated, and people are being displaced. Uh, and you, everything from truck drivers to lawyers and bankers. And now I'm curious what your thoughts are on you know, the value of not having technical skills, you know, the liberal arts education, the ability to think. And I'm curious if you think it's actually more important to teach young people how to code, or if it's more important to teach them how to think. I was about to say, fuck coding, think. I was, uh, before you said that, I didn't say anything. I think you must have Don't tweet that. Yeah. I'm, I'm, um, I, sometimes I, it feels like the world is full of human potential, but we're on the brink of a disaster. I don't have time to be polite. Anyway. Um, <laughs> no, I'm the reverend. <laughs> um, I'm actually excited about the whole man versus the machine thing because I think that forces us humans to really step into our mastery and our leadership and what it means to fully tap into our potential. Creative potential, thinking potential as human beings as opposed to kind of learn a particular job from here to there and um, how to handle it and kind of repeatedly do it for 50 years of your life or whatever it is. So I'm actually excited because more machines will hopefully make us become more human, step into our humanity and therefore our human potential at fuller. So that's, that's what I'm actually hoping for. And while I work and I have worked and I've dated geeks all my life and I have huge respect for technical people, I, I really, really do and I'm an aspiring geek myself, I honestly believe that human potential comes in so many different shapes and forms and it's about really honing in on what it is in yourself and following that path as opposed to kind of finding a job in, a, in, in order to be able to do this thing from nine to five and earn some money in order to do your growth and development somewhere else after hours. I think that's ludicrous. So I'm excited. Thank you. Anyone got any thoughts? Jordan, you look like you can't stop yourself. <laughs> Come, Come on, let's have it. I thought I was going to get boxed in as the, the black uh, Baptist pastor. Uh, you are. Yeah. <laughs> He's going to be um, off piece, I can tell. I, I, don't, I don't think you have to choose between the two, uh, um, as long as you're careful with, with language. So um, I think uh, to be a coach, I think coding is not just about coding. You have to think, right? So I think I would, the way that I would describe it is I would. I would advise my nephew, I would advise him to be a software engineer versus a software developer. And this is biased by me being an engineer, but I think at the core of what you're doing is you're problem solving. And uh, it's going to be a much longer time before machines replace that. Um, but I do agree, like I do personally believe that uh, the create, whatever is related to creativity and problem solving, and problem solving with creative sort of mindset, they're, they're going to be the new sort of uh, cool guys on the block. And it goes in cycles, right? Like it used to be the jocks. Now it's the geeks, and then we're gonna all get replaced by the like uh, theater, like uh, creative artists. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, humans, maybe. Yeah, get replaced by the humans. But uh, I, I was with um, the author of *Sapiens* and uh, *Homo Deus* the other day, Yuval Noah Harari, and um, he was talking about the fourth industrial revolution, which we are in. And he said, if you think the fourth industrial revolution is going to come and hit you and then we will stabilize thereafter, then think again, because it's going to hit you and hit you and hit you and hit you again. And he said it's not the loss of jobs that he's concerned about when it comes to automation. It's our ability to reskill ourselves every 10 years or less. And that is the nature of, I guess, employment but also how we survive will be much more aligned with lifelong learning and not what your employer wants you to do, but your personal responsibility for who you become next time round. So you know, if you want to come back as a stick insect or a geek or whatever you want to come back next time as, then you've got 10 years to think about it, according to him. Another question. Did you have something to say, no, I was Jean? I going to say that you know, it's really equipping the, the next generation with that growth mindset that 
Yeah. You don't have to just be one thing forever. And I yeah. think that's super important. You can change careers as many times as you want to, as long as you're willing to learn those new skills and anyone can learn anything. We'll come back next year as completely different people. <laughs> Any other questions from the audience? We have one at the front here. Yeah, that was a fascinating talk um, and debate. Can I um, can I link stereotypes with an earlier topic of salaries? Um, I I want to know what your thoughts are um, between sort of the different genders as to how open people are about salaries. Um, I had, or maybe culturally, I had a particular experience that was um, had a big impact on me. Um, I I was in Silicon Valley for a very short period of time. Um, and, I, and at that time, I was negotiating a salary for a different job, or actually not negotiating a salary for a new job. Um, and then uh, one of my friends who worked at Google at the time just asked me point blank, um, what's the salary that you're asking for? And I, I told her what salary I wasn't asking for, um, but what salary I, you know, I just settled with. Um, and then she said, you need to be asking for three times that amount. And I just found it really empowering because it was, you know, a one of the first women who had spoken to me about you know what she thought I was worth and I'd never um, and I the only other people that I, I have seen speak to each other about that were all of the guys on my you know engineering course so I, I sort of have this impression that um, men tend to speak very openly with each other about salaries but women we don't open up about that to actually challenge each other and share that information we do have platforms like Glassdoor that you know, it does start to make that more visible now, but would love to hear your thoughts on that. So my, um, my position on that is that networks really matter. And I will just say one massive difference between the tech sector in this country versus the tech sector in Silicon Valley, as an example, is that we definitely stand on the shoulders of each other in this community here. I think we are very supportive here Maybe because it's smaller, we tend to know virtually everybody, um, and we tend to be very open and connected. And if we had had that conversation, I absolutely would have talked to you in that same way. You know, what do you think? I probably wouldn't have said you're worth three times more. I probably would have said this is what everybody else is thinking about. Um, but you know, in a mentoring conversation, those things happen. I think quite a lot. Jean, would you agree? Absolutely. I mean, when I look back at my earlier career. I, I would never have thought to ask anyone what is the average salary, but obviously joining the tech sector, um, Jacqueline's absolutely right, it's a lot more transparent and people have those open conversations and obviously with the gender pay gap, it, it's, it's just sort of front of mind when you're thinking about it more, am I getting paid as much as the person next to me and um, we need to set a, a time to actually have that conversation. And by the way, the gender pay gap, people talk about this all the time. Um, you may not know this because this wasn't on Black Mirror, but it is. Um, <laughs> the gen <laughs> and you haven't seen it. <laughs> the gender pay gap, though, um, people are saying, you know, it's the wrong metrics, da, da, da. But actually, the only thing we need to worry about with the gender pay gap is it shows you where the power and influence is within an organisation. And it points to things like... I think the stat is, in retail, as an example, which is a very, very big business in this country, with the largest e-commerce market um, uh, in the world, after China, I think. Um, and in this country, only 8% of jobs are in either finance or leadership roles in retail. So the power and influence is not in the places where they invest the money. And that's really interesting because those sorts of facts are super interesting from the gender pay gap piece and that's where we can all make the difference. Um, how are we doing for time team talent? One more question? Great, thanks John. So I just wanted to follow on from the previous salary question and I was interested to know your opinions on where you would lie in terms of requesting candidates on salary information. So, for example, for certain states, I believe Massachusetts in, this, in the states have legislated against it because data has shown that often women and ethnic minorities are impacted negatively by within the salary history and thus we're just perpetuating the ongoing salary disparities. But I know that a lot of companies are, are very keen on this information, so I was just interested to get your views on that. I really like your question. Um, I'm not sure my... Yeah, it does work. Um, so, 
as an employer, so that's to, to all of the founders and all of those of you who are on recruiting teams, it's, you know, you're supposed to be in a stronger negotiating position if, like, you are the second person who names the figure. So, like, see what they say and then see if we can get it lower. We say no. Like, we come at it from, we research, we do our work as an employer, and we sit down with a candidate and we say, we may be wrong because you're in that, in that job or in that line of work, not us. But based on our research, what you're doing right now is worth between 60 and 70K. Are we right? What do you think? So we are the ones to name the figure, figure first. We are, we are the ones to take responsibility for it. And we will come to be um, argued out of it if, if we're wrong, if we've done the research wrong. So we kind of come from a position of kind of total transparency and humility about it, and we name the figure first, always. And then after they join, uh, every six months, sometimes every year, they are encouraged to review that based on their current responsibilities and the current shape of the role. Yeah, I think it's transparency is really important here, and, and looking at it from the entry level position and apprentices in particular, we work with employers, and when we do, they need to publish the salary that that job is worth, and we help broadcast that. We make sure we have conversations about young people we're working with, are you still living with your parents? If you're commuting into London, can you afford this? Um, you know, what, what sort of salary do you need to live the current life that you're living? And because we're working with lots of people from very different financial backgrounds, half of our apprentices have claimed free school meals, so they have no form of parental support. This is really important. But we do also teach them, and it's, it's not entitlement, and people often get confused actually between this, this kind of idea of millennial entitlement and then Gen Z is still quite different soon, but you've got to teach them how to and when to have the conversation around, am I being paid what is a fair amount for what I'm doing? When should I, be, when should I receive more money for what I'm doing? And also, how does the salary I'm being paid fit into my value to the company and what the people around me are earning? So we've just got to do more to actually teach people about the context of the salary dis discussion, more than just looking at a number and figuring out if I'm an employer, can I save money? If I'm looking for a job, how do I get as much money as I can possibly get? Yeah, yeah I was just going to say, I think um, that section should be pulled out of application forms in the first place because I think it gives you that imposter syndrome. If you've come from a job where, I don't know, you were getting paid 30000 less than what has been advertised, already you feel inferior and you feel like you're negotiating from a, a worse off position. So I, think, I think it should be scrapped. Very clear. Jordan, you were... Yeah, I was just going to say that in addition to just the initial salary, but also promotions um, in terms of making sure that that gap doesn't sort of grow or, or extend, um, I, I think there's also an onus on the, the founder, whoever's in charge of recruiting human resources, to be really honest and know what, have an idea of what they think this person is worth and be honest about that because related to sort of the previous question as well between men and women, in our experience, women uh, negotiate their salary less aggressively than men do. And so that if you're a man and you're in that sort of power position of negotiating that sal salary on the other side, you can use that to your advantage and say, oh, well, they just asked for a number that's well below what I was willing to give them, so I'll just take their number if that's all they want. Yeah. Um, and I think you need to be really, if you had a number here, that said, this is what I think this person worth because they des they deserve it. They've shown it, um, and you get proposed a, a different number. You need to you need to take that higher number, and and that's that's happened with, uh, with us exactly. I went in thinking uh, I want this woman to negotiate more aggressively because her colleagues are doing that, and she's missing out. So I want to give her the opportunity to learn how to do this. And I got some perspectives from, from some other females in my life that said, well, no, it's the other way around. She wants you to recognize her value. Um, and offer her something that recognizes her value. And, and that takes effort to think about that more than just say, I'm going to say this, you're going to say this, we're going to meet in the middle. Um, yeah, and acno acknowledgement really matters. So that's a good thing to end on. Um, I don't know whether we have confused you or clarified things for you, um, but certainly it's been a joy to share uh, our panel with you. Pau, you and Jordan, June, thank you very much, and thank you for being here.